Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In the previous two units for chapter 15, uh, we've been talking about the idea that certain sentences involve a null pronoun known as pro. It shows up in conditions where uh, there's no case marking, but the, uh, there appears to be an extra theta roll floating around. So we propose that pro sits in these embedded clauses where there's no um, case marking on the subject, but we need an extra DP in order not to violate the theta criterion. But what we haven't yet talked about is how pro gets its meaning, how it's connected um, to other DPs in the sentence, if it is. We need to talk about something that's a little bit like binding theory. Uh, and the, the, the theory that covers this is known as control theory. So first of all, there are a number of different types of pro. Um, in what's about to show up, um, all the indices are indices of binding theory, not the indices of theta grids. The first kind of pro is known as pro-arb or arbitrary pro. Um, Arbitrary pro shows up when the pronoun does not have a, a specific DP it refers to. Instead, it's sort of a general um, statement about you know, how life works, or there's an arbitrary reference. So for example, the sentence, to find a spouse, go to a dating service. The, um, the pro in the first clause there uh, is arbitrary pro. It means um, for someone it means something along the lines of, for someone to find a spouse, they should go to a dating service, right? So um, this pro um, is arbitrary pro. Now there's also non-arbitrary pro. Uh, non-arbitrary pro um, shows up in two forms as well. Non-arbitrary pro is it like in sentences like, Gene tried to behave. Here, um, the pro uh, must refer back to gene, so it's not a, an arbitrary referent. It's referring back to, an, to another DP in the sentence, just like anaphores and pronouns could do. Um, now, there's, uh, among non-arbitrary pro, there are two varieties. The first variety is called obligatory control. An obligatory control holds when there must be a co-indexing between the the pronoun and some other argument in the sentence. So for example, in gene tried to behave, pro can only refer to gene, it can't refer to somebody else. So gene tried to behave can't mean that um, Mary was behaving and gene tried to make sure that happened. Gene has to be the behavior. So that's obligatory control. <clears throat> Non-obligatory control um, does not have that requirement. It can refer back to another noun phrase in the sentence, but it doesn't have to. So in this way, um, it's behaving like a pronoun. So Robert knows that it is essential to be well-behaved. The subject of to be well-behaved can either refer back to Robert or to somebody else. Now this is a confusing set of patterns because obligatory control makes it look a little bit like um, an anaphore. And non-obligatory control makes it look a little bit like a pronoun. So we sort of have to figure out what type of element um, pro really is. So let's ask the question, is, is pro in our expression a pronoun or an anaphore? Well, first of all, it can be bound. So uh, in obligatory and uh, non-obligatory, uh, non-arbitrary control, um, it can refer back to something. So it isn't in our expression, because remember, our expressions can never be bound. Um, it isn't bound uh, within its clause because all the pros are in embedded clauses. So that suggests it isn't an anaphore. Um, and it certainly is the case, as we mentioned before, that it behaves in some ways like a pronoun in non-obligatory control environments. So Robert knows it is essential to be well-behaved. Can, pro can either refer to Robert or can refer to somebody else. That's just like uh, a pronoun in a tense clause. Robert knows that he is well-behaved. 
that could be Robert or it could be somebody else. So um, the pro is behaving like a pronoun in this non-obligatory context. <clears throat> so that's one thing. But um, the problem is that sometimes when it's obligatorily bound, it's actually behaving like an anaphor in the sense that it must refer back to something. But we've argued that this pro is actually downstairs in an, in an embedded clause. Um, so it appears to be neither, uh, it's definitely not in our expression, and it has some properties of pronouns and some properties of anaphors. So uh, what are we going to do about that? Well, one, one common approach to controls um, is that um, pro is neither a pronoun nor an anaphor. And so it isn't even subject to binding theory. The co-reference comes from something else. There is a whole theory about this, but it's probably one of the messiest bits of syntactic theory. Uh, the literature is very confusing. Um, control theory um, uh, has a number of points that seem to be true that we can run through, but you'll see there are some problems with every part of it. So uh, first of all, we can note that like binding theory, C command seems to be involved. Uh, the controller has to C command the pro. So Gene's father is reluctant to leave. Gene cannot control pro. Um, only Gene's father can control pro. So like that's just like what goes on with anaphors and pronouns, right? There has to be uh, a strict C command relationship um, of the antecedent over the controlled element. So that makes it look a little bit like binding theory. But there's other things that make sure that it's really not. Um, so first of all, let's observe that in some sentences, um, the controller is the noun phrase that's closest to the pro. So in Gene persuaded Robert to leave, Robert is doing the leaving. So pro is co-indexed with Robert um, in this object control construction. But Here's another object control construction. Gene promised to leave. Pr promise, Gene promised Susan to leave. Susan cannot be the antecedent of this pro. It has to be Gene. So these two sentences are uh, nearly identical in structure. In fact, they are identical in structure. They have, um, they have a, an object control verb, like persuade or promise. Um, they have a theme element and they have a pro in the subject of the embedded clause, but they differ in that they are exactly reversed in what the possible indexings are. So pro um, with promise has to refer to Gene, and pro with persuade has to refer to Robert. And that's uh, definitely a problem. Um, so they're identical to the... Um, they're identical in structure, but they differ in the verb. So one proposal that's been made is that the controller is specified in the theta grid. So the lexicon contains the information that per the, um, the controller and persuade constructions is the object, but the controller and promise constructions is the subject. So what might that look like? Um, our theta grids would simply specify that with persuade, the theme was the controller, and with promise, the agent was the controller. Um, and that seems to be the solution for those two verbs, but it doesn't work for every verb. Um, there are verbs like beg, and beg is uh, a really confusing predicate, because there are some cases where the controller with beg is the uh, direct object. So Louise begged Kate to leave her job. We know Kate is the um, subject of the embedded clause because um, the her is referring back uh, to Kate. So there's this indexing of K between Kate and pro. And uh, so that makes it look like the verb promise. Um, I'm sorry, the verb persuade. So Louise persuaded Kate to leave her, leave her job. That would be the same indexing. But then you have sentences like this one. Luis begged Kate to be allowed to quit his job. Here, pro is referring back to Luis, not Kate. In fact, it's not allowed to refer to Kate. So here, begged is behaving like the promise verb. Luis promised Kate 
uh, to leave his job um, than the pro is being co-annexed with Louise. What's the different here um, is the embedded verb. So it's not the main verb that's determining what the control possibilities are. It's the embedded verb. Um, and that is deeply confusing um, because um, the other cases we looked at, we would want to specify the controller in the lexical entry for the main verb. But here it seems to be um, on the embedded verb. So then what's the story? How do we get um, control to work out? Well, um, there's, uh, there's a couple of options. One is maybe control isn't syntactic. Maybe um, it's pragmatic, where pragmatic means comes from real world knowledge. It comes about by just understanding context. So understanding the difference between the first begged and the second begged has to do with the fact that um, we know that um, uh, to leave her job is going to be something that uh, you're going to ask somebody to do. Um, to be allowed to do something is something that you will be requesting. So maybe it's just real world knowledge, or maybe we just haven't figured it out yet. That's always a possibility.